Um, so I am going to start. So thank you all for joining, first of all, uh, and taking out time. I know Ramzan is a little bit difficult. You just feel like not wanting to do anything. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm going to start with just giving a little introduction about ID8. So we are a human-centered design firm. Um, and in short, our mission is to build a more equitable world. Um, and we do this by offering three core services, uh, which is experience and brand design, service and business innovation, and research and strategic insights. It may seem like a lot of words, but it's essentially doing all sort of design work that you might need, whether that's, you know, server design related, digital design related, bad design related, whether it's like a sort of like a business problem that you have that needs solving, or you just need some insights um, around a product or service that you currently have. So we offer like a full suite of services on that. Some of the work that we've done uh, spans across multiple countries within Pakistan and also outside. Uh, and these are some of the partners we've worked with. So these are all industry leaders, international organizations. Uh, so we work with like, you know, smaller firms as well as international design firms and international organizations that work in the development sector. Um, and the industries that we have covered, uh, we sort of worked in like a whole bunch of industries, but once we sort of, you know, reflect and see that's more or less in these six domains, which is financial inclusion, business, uh, sorry, banking and financial ecosystems, startup innovation, agriculture technologies, public health, and process and service digitalization. And this list continues to expand every day. Um, so, you know, if you have a project, if you think you want to collaborate on something, please do reach out to us. Now, coming to the subject of this event we have, what is design GOI and we, why we sort of thought, you know, let's, let's do something um, and let's call it design GOI and like the need for stories in the work that we sort of do. Um, so essentially, like um, if you've noticed recently, there's been a lot of events coming up related to design just because the design community in Pakistan has been going a lot. Uh, and it's great to see those sort of events um, and they sort of focus on, you know, perspectives or problem solving or methodologies or sort of the way to present your case studies or like an avenue to present your projects. Um, and that's a way to sort of nurture the growing community that we have. Um, and all of these sort of have this takeaway uh, that, you know, you whoever is attending should go away with like a process or like an insight to build up their skills. Um, so in that sort of context, the stories, the work that we do, it sometimes naturally takes a backseat. Uh, even though those stories and those narratives are just as important um, as knowing why or how to do things and how to build up those skills. Uh, because they tell you why the work that you do is interesting and important and what makes it so fun that you stick to it and you keep coming back to design and you want to go on. Um, so I do understand, you know, just like working in design, having that impact and seeing people engage with your work is like a quite a strong pull on its own. But I'm pretty sure that all of us have had stretches at times where, you know, everything seems lost and you just like, does any of this work even matter? Um, and is it even working? It's an uphill battle. Uh, there's so much to be done. Should I, should I continue doing? Should I not continue doing? And that is where these stories come in. Uh, because it's the little things in the work that we do that keep us hooked um, when everything else is failing. They sort of pull us back into the world of design when we start to waver. Because there's just so much joy, uh, even outside of like a strictly work and strictly design perspective. Uh, because these stories and these interactions and these engagements on our projects, they sort of uh, influence the way we see things, we do things, and also just generally shape us up as people. Um, so these, these sort of stories also don't necessarily always have to be very profound or life-changing. Um, they, they're like little things, like if I recall some of the stories that I remember and have played with me, is um, like the best halwa I had with like, at like a research participant's house. Or this child who became a friend uh, on a COVID vaccination project in the days that we were in that community. Or, you know, this hug that someone in the field gave you that just stayed with you because it's so warm and so heartfelt. So these little things um, that, you know, and then also one more thing that just takes with me and I keep bringing it up again and again is this field trip to Sakhar uh, in like a heat wave that is 48 degrees and we just decided to explore the city after field work in that heat wave. That was quite a memorable experience. 
Um, so, you know, these things, they always stay with us and they often stay with us longer and in a more deeper way than any of the insights of the work that we do. Um, and that is why we brought you Design Goi. It is an attempt to give us space to those stories uh, and to give breathing room to the things that we don't always get to talk about, but are always uh, on the top of our, of our head uh, when we uh, talk about our work. So that is what Design Goi is. Um, and today we have three wonderful guests with us who are going to tell us three different stories. Uh, one of them is about a 19 year old trailblazer who has a disability. Another is about how this person used videos to evoke empathy in a non-designer crowd. Uh, and then the third is uh, about the intersection of memes and design research. So really looking forward to all three of these. Um, Firstly, I'm going to introduce the first speaker, who is Nayab. She is a colleague at ID Innovation also. Um, and over the years, she has worked on several projects that have ranged from financial inclusion to uh, sexual and reproductive health. Uh, and she is super interested in the, in the intersection of gender, class, and disability. Um, so actually, before we start with Nayab, I have three short um, rapid fire questions for you. The first one is, um, what are three things that we all that you'll always find in your bag when you go out on field research? You're asking us? Yes, I'm asking you first. Um, my wave. Okay. <laughs> Good one. Two um, more. Antidepressants. Okay. Uh, and um water. Water. Okay. That's Good, good combination of <laughs> three things. Yeah. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, what is one thing in your room right now that you would like to change or redesign? Any one thing. It could be an object, it could be anything around you. Um, I would definitely want to have more trees. Like, I don't know if you can see, but there's a tree in, in the background. It's a bit uh, blurred. I've seen your background before, so I know there's like lots of trees already. Yeah, so yeah. I would definitely want another tree. Okay. And lastly, are you more of a tang person or more of a Jamishiri person? Jamishiri. Jamishiri. Definitely. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, let's move on to your story. You have the floor now. Okay, so um, my colleague and I were conducting research in SINs in 2022. And it was a, a project on financial inclusion and we were working with Jazz Cash. And um, this was right before the floods had hit uh, those areas. And it, there was a heat wave, like Fizan mentioned, it was shortly after that trip that we went. There was a heat wave and um, it, it was like a climate catastrophe type scene thing going on. Um, and uh, for some reason, our client was pushing us to, you know, like just conduct the research. And uh, we were, it was our last interview and um, this was a mystery agent. So a mystery agent is basically um, a, ja a woman who was a jazz cash agent who did not have her name matching, uh, her name in the system of jazz cash matching her CNIC. So it was someone else's name. She was working under someone else's name um, and we didn't know her real name. And on our way there to the last uh, interview, our car got stuck uh, in this huge chopper um, and the bumper broke and we had to like, come. we were in the middle of nowhere and you know, there's this small village and the bumper broke and we're standing outside. And we're also worried, you know, if there's heavy rain, how will we get back? Because we were living in Sakhar. And this uh, village was in Kambar Shadat Kot, which was like two hours away from Sakhar. Um, also near sundown. So a lot of things happening, which were not going in our favor. But uh, the field staff kept insisting, Can I, you should talk to this girl. Because, uh, you know, like, you'll you'll have a good good story to hear from her. And so we ended up somehow our car was recovered and we ended up going to her house and we met this, you know, like short heighted girl. Um, but, uh, we started interviewing her and 
she revealed how she was only 19 and she had a disability and she had been working for two years as a as a as someone who had a uh, as a sales agent of jazz cash as well as someone who had a small shop in her house uh, where she would sell like women's products and little like um and uh, did i mention that she was university educated she was doing her bsc um and really like uh, commitment towards uh, you know, earning for her family. And then we later found out that actually her entire family had the same disability as her. So she was one of the two people who were working in the family to support uh, the entire family. Um, and, you know, uh, fast forward, we kind of uh, end the interview and we don't meet her again, obviously. But uh, uh, when we went back to Lahore, we had to send in compensation to all the uh, participants that we interviewed and we would jazz cash it to them. So this was around the time when, the, when you know, the climate catastrophe in Sin was getting really bad. And uh, so we sent, one of the people that we sent money to, compensation to was Saira. And uski call came and she was like, uh, I thought that you accidentally sent this money to me. And uh, who is this speaking? And, uh, you know, what's up, basically. And we told her, no, we interviewed you. And, you know, this is compensation. Uh, and then we started asking her okay, how the things were at her village uh, because of the flooding. And she told us that, you know, like the entire village was flooded and people were in a frenzy. So from there, uh, Saira became uh, one of our focal persons who uh, organized flood relief efforts for her entire village. Um, and we would direct like donations towards her account. And she would, she would you know, like really um, support the entire village's ration through her efforts. So basically what she would do is she would go to every house and um, make detailed handwritten notes for all the families, their children, how many animals they lost, and then would send it to us. And, you know, through idea, we would then, um, you know, di divert donations. Uh, and before this all happened, like now, to, uh, sorry, before I say that, she also started giving like, um, like himmat of zai ke sessions like community sessions like she would gather all the community women and would start giving like these short like lectures on how you should not lose hope um how it's going to be better uh she was doing a lot of community work for her entire village and that was really inspirational uh it also really um the way that she stood up in this time of crisis, uh, it really helped her um, face less discrimination from the people in her village. Because before, uh, and as I talked to her, she would say that, you know, people would make fun of her. She would she would avoid going out. Uh, but after she organized all the flood relief efforts, um, people started respecting her more. She had a lot of more mobility. Uh, she was the one who would go to the city, buy all the ration for the village and then bring it back. So generally she became like a really important community figure. And yeah, that was Saira's story. I think she's a very inspirational person that we met in the field. Thank you for that, Nayab. Yes, definitely. She sounds like a true champion and like a... Uh, like you, like you said, you know, she was also giving like motivational um, speeches and like making sure that everyone is in this together. Uh, and she's like, you said she's just 19? She is now 22. Uh, yeah, but at the time she was... But at the time that we met her, she was uh, 19. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, it's so much happening. Um, so I, I think you've also been like in touch with her after this, like a couple of times. It's like, so how is she doing? 
like how is this how has the journey been so far she's currently pursuing uh, a masters degree in a local university because she nice. really wanted to further her education and help her mm-hmm. family uh, her father stopped working because he got sick and so did her mother and uh, so in the entire responsibility fell on her so her brother and her are pursuing this master's education so that they can do something okay nice nice um and generally um so in this uh, locality that you research were like people as open to women having these sort of you know influencer roles or was she sort of like an exception and she made her way in like her place herself Okay, that's a great question because in our research we found that a lot of women in Sindh had really low mobility, um, because and by that I mean it's not okay for them to go out and work. Uh, they can they're supposed to stay in the confines of their home and work for women related problems or women related issues. Um, she was working as a jazz cash agent, and even that was looked down on. upon because that was something that was a man's job to do you know mobile mein money load karana ya kisi ko paise bhejna ya bhijwana was something mm-hmm. which was very like gender uh, gendered uh, but she was already showing like all of this um, you know this ability to move past those barriers but when she um, kind of stood up in the flood relief efforts uh again it was not you don't see women organizing flood relief over there in that locality um and that to a woman with a disability uh so it was i think it was something that uh, it's a testament to her courage and her desire to do something big that i think helped her move past those barriers definitely definitely yeah um and people in the audience if you also have any questions please feel free to type them in the chat and i'll make sure to ask to uh, yeah thank you for that nayab um we will move on from that super inspiring story to adonia who is our next guest um she is a mixed method ux researcher and designer and has a master's degree in hcd and engineering from university of washington um she you know she uses a design practices mostly in the financial sector and believes in continuous discovery for research outside of work she spends her time watching true crime shows and going down uh, reddit rabbit holes about those shows um so before i give the floor to you adonia i also have like two similar questions that i asked nayab what are three things we'll always find in your bag when you go out for research um my diary definitely okay. my phone and water yeah and also i think i okay. want to say my the book as well because you sometimes just need it if you don't have uh-huh. it <laughs> yeah 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 perfect and what is it one thing in your room right now that you want to redesign uh my sofa it's really bad it can sit on it in your back hurt so definitely i, I want to throw that sofa away okay. are you sitting on it right now or are you sitting on something else there is adonia breaking up just for me or others also and i think it also like to change my internet connection okay for me yeah. as well yeah. that I, works internet connection um okay can you hear us adonia if you can maybe turn off your video maybe that will help Okay, is this better? And yeah, I think I definitely want to change my internet connection. <laughs> okay. Before my sofa. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, and lastly, what's the last TV show that you binge watched? Um, the last TV show that I binge binge watched, I. God, I'm forgetting. Um, one day. Yes. Yes. One yes. Day. Okay. I also I saw that recently. Like I saw the film like just like two days before because I was like I need to see that before watching the show yeah, and no. then. Yeah, yeah, I saw the movie like many years ago, and even if you watch the movie, there's nothing that can prepare you for what's going to happen. That's yeah, all. even though like it was, it was all like this, like very similar stuff, but like you, you still, like obviously, what happens is happens, and you can't, nothing can prepare yeah. you for that. Yeah, I was sad. 
uh, but yeah, great. I will hand over the floor to you and this is your visual. Perfect. Okay, so I have a bad internet connection. So if I'm ever breaking up, just let me know. Perfect. Okay. So Nayab, thank you so much for sharing your story. It definitely set context by some chance of luck because my story is also about branches banking and specifically focused on the agent. So the image that you see here, it doesn't really tell you much. It's just a street in Karachi. And I'll tell you, so this is a street in Clifton. And um, this photo in itself doesn't really tell you much. And one of the best things I like about field research is uncovering insights that you don't even think about. And I call them gems that you weren't looking for, but these are valuable gems. So the visual that you see on the screen, um, as I said, it doesn't tell you much. It's just a street with people on it. And yes, that is the correct observation. But there's so much more to it, which is honestly why I'm sharing it here. But honestly, like I don't want to hype it out too much because um, what I'm going to share, it's more of a story and my experience with this and less about this specific picture. So um, I'll tell you why I was taking this picture, just to give you some context. I, um, I used to work at a bank as a UX designer. And I was specifically looking after their branches banking vertical, similar to Jazz Cash and Easy Visa. Now, when we say branches banking, it's basically serving your end user through an intermediary, like uh, the image that Nayab she shared of that person who was uh, an agent for Jazz Cash. So that is who an agent is. And uh, they're ideally small business owners or Ikariana store owners. During this research, I also found that some... Um, stationery shops, local stationery shops, photocopiers, um, and also your local key makers, people who make duplicate your keys, they're also your agent. So anybody can be your agent as long as they fulfill some banking requirements. So now they are the backbone of your branches banking channel. However, these agents are mostly overlooked when you're researching on any um, M wallet or branches banking payment system. So I was assigned the task to actually research on these agents and they act as intermediaries between the customer and the bank. And what they do is they take your physical cash and convert that into digital money and digital into physical. So what they help you with is bank transfers, um, a deposit and withdrawal. Now, this also brings you to the formal banking channel. I'd like to set some context here. So I'll pause for a second and I'll give you some numbers. We know that Pakistan is the fifth largest population in the world. We excel in that. We are also the third largest unbanked economy in the world. So there's numbers, some numbers that say that over 100 million adults in Pakistan are unbanked, which is around like over, over half the population is still unbanked. And there's a lot of research on why people don't want to be banked. And there's several reasons that they don't feel comfortable going in a bank. They don't trust a bank. But still to bring them to the banking side, the fi like formal financial channel, you have to do something. And that is what I set to do on this field research, where I didn't want to research on the users. I wanted to understand how the agents operate. Now, again, if you think why users aren't using banking services, we look at it from a user perspective. And uh, my story here today is about using a user perspective to actually create empathy around the agent experience and the experience for agents. Now, a lot of the times to, to create empathy, you have to see yourself as the user. Now, the people that I had to present to, they were all bankers, traditional bankers who do not care about what story you're telling. So in order to make them care about it, what we did, me and my team, and some of them are standing here right next to the HBL Connect shop, we decided to record the entire experience of walking into any agent shop. How would that look like? So you start from the end of the street, and then you start walking towards the street. And why are you doing that? You're looking around as if you're actually walking to the agent. And bankers who are sitting in that boardroom, we ask them to visualize the same thing and imagine yourself doing this activity. Now, I'll give you some context, some things that you can't see in this picture. There's a sabzi wala on the left side of the Connect shop, the HBL Connect branding that you see. There is a dood and lassi wala on the right side of the shop. There is a local restaurant for people in Karachi who recognize the street. There's Karachi Brost at one end of the street. And behind the street, um, um, you broke up again, Aruni. Can you repeat the last sentence after the last oh, Yes. Okay. Okay. So yeah, on the same problem again. Maybe turn off your video if that helps, because I'm very really clearly yeah. interested in the story. Is this better? Yes, this is. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So now think of yourself as somebody who wants to perform a transaction and they do not have a bank account. 
in this shop, um, right next to the HBL Connect shop, on the left side is a sabzi wala, on the right side is a dahi wala. Now, people from Karachi who recognize the street in Clifton, at the end of the street, am I? No, I think, did it happen again? No, no, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah. So at the end of the street is Karachi Roast, a local Karachi restaurant. And on like behind the street is a women's beauty salon. So this street attracts women and men. But the women that you see standing here, like does anyone, anybody want to guess like why are they standing here? This a group of women right here in the middle of the street in Karachi in their burkas. And Fazan, if there's any responses, just, I guess, just tell me what they are. Sure, yeah. Nothing yet. Nothing uh, yet? Some, someone yet. saying it's a, it's a committee party. Good, good, Mariam, but it's not. I'll tell you what. So this shop, when we were studying how the agents shops, how, how are they serving customers, right? In order to create an experience for agents, we want to understand how agents are serving customers. So these agents, they had an other small window on the side and they said, this window we've made for women because our female customers feel more safer, more comfortable performing their transactions here. Now, what that window looks like is, an, is another picture. And in that window, there is um, a stamp pad in case you want to do that. And there's a half cut lemon there. Now, who left the lemon there? Nobody knows. But that just goes to show how you're serving, like how are you trying to serve, how you're making the experience comfortable for your audience by by not even keeping like it's not even a window where you can serve customers and we saw a lot so these women now i'll tell you why they're here so a lot of bisp basic income support program disperses they happen through branches banking agents because they have a much widespread network these women came to this street to collect their bisp disbursals and because it happens on a specific date of the month they're standing here because one of the agents decided to sit outside on his bike and perform the and and like create give them the disbursements. So you don't actually need to create a separate window. These women are very comfortable standing on the street alongside men, just receiving their disbursements from that they received from the government. So this was one of the interesting observations that we found on the field. And if we hadn't gone there and uh many cheese patana chalti. And I specifically went to the side because I was like, I want to capture this where I see the shop that has a window for female customers and female customers are comfortably standing on the side of the street, collecting their money. And they felt more comfortable coming to this street because this street, the dynamics of this street is as such that is always uh, populated with uh, a diverse set of people and mostly women as well. To give you, again, some numbers, um, there are around 14,000 active branches and 15,000 ATM. That we lost you again. Now, there's companies that say that uh, they have, oh my God. Okay, <laughs> it's my internet, I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, okay, I will resume. So now what happens is um, there, uh, yeah, I was giving some numbers about just to, again, set some context. So there are around 14,000 active bank branches in Pakistan and around 15,000 ATMs, just like slightly higher than branches. However, our branches banking agents, on the other hand, are 288,000. So this network is much widely spread. And the reason I started this research was because we were viewing all agents from the same lens. Now, the story that Nayab shared, by some chance, they found an agent who was a leader in the community. So when we went out to do this research, we wanted to see how our agents are serving a customer and what is an agent like in the community because an agent needs to provide three things to your users, right? They need to be accessible. They need to have trust uh, from the people. And the third thing uh, is that they need to give them cash management services. Now, if these are the three things that agent has, then that just means it's a good agent. Now, if this was a thing like categorizing your agents, then the agent that Nayab identified would definitely be getting much more commission, but she wasn't. So our project here or my research was very focused on the agent experience. So we went down to the field and we identified over a hundred metrics of what, what makes a good agent and it's the agent themselves, but it's also the kind of business, business that they run, where they're running the business from, what does their shop look like on the outside, on the inside, what, what products are they selling? So these are some of the things that were there. Other things are like, how accessible is the, is the shop? Uh, is it on the main street? Uh, how do you get to that shop? What does that look like? What the branding is like, blah, blah. 
So there are around 100 metrics. And using a video telling story format, I uh, told the board member, like the boardroom, that, okay, these are the metrics because when you're actually empathizing with the user, you think of yourself as the user and you see the point of view. That's when you actually understand that there could be so many other factors that you weren't looking at. So based on these factors, we created a rating. You were breaking up. Now what the categorization that looks like. Okay, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. It's fine. All right. It's, it's okay. like 30 so seconds you're lost and then you come back up. So you can continue. Okay, perfect. 30 seconds is, yeah. not, is not too bad. Yeah. So we created an agent categorization matrix. Now using that matrix, we identify what kind of agent they are. And based on that, we provide them uh, specific like different kinds of training because somebody who's done their master's, and uh, I'm going to tell you that there are people with master's degree who are also um, your branches banking agents, but there's also people who uh, were studied till grade five, maybe. So your training plan would look different for them. And based on this rating that is assigned to them based on the kind of shop they have, what kind of services they provide, you also redesign the commission plan. So if somebody is a community leader, is an influencer in the community, and based on those factors, you can see that they are, you devise a different kind of commission plan for them. So this also motivates the agents to perform better, to serve the customer better. This gives us visibility of the customer experience as well. What does it look like for offline channels for over-the-counter transactions? And it also does not use the one-size-fits-all method for our 288,000 agents. And now, as you go up in the rating, your uh, commission also increases. And then through a gamified method, we also teach the agents how exactly can you uh, take your rating up. So this creates um, like a program for them, for agents as well, that, okay, now we have a grade C, how do we get to grade B and then grade A? So using our agents to actually bringing people to the financial banking sector, like bank, to make them financially more banked, to educate customers as well, how they can save, how they can invest, because now there's also some saving uh, accounts that you can use with your branches banking accounts. And um, yeah, so this is how you can use your agents to create a better experience for agents and in turn uh, for your customers. Now, this does not give bring much money to the business. And that's something corporations want. So how do you convince them? You just tell them what impact it will make and how many customers it can eventually bring. And that's when you slowly start to create that effect in, in a place where there's no designers who don't speak your language. So you have to speak the language of the user in order to make them understand what could eventually bring them business. And when I'm saying this for you, it's pretty obvious. Yeah, these are the factors that would identify a customer experience, but it's actually not that simple for corporations. A video helped, and I thought I'd just share that story of how I use video telling. It's a very common prototype and tool that we use, but how I use that in front of non-banker, uh, in front of designers, like traditional bankers, to actually convey what I want to do. And yes, that is my story. Thank you. This was super insightful. I loved how detailed you went into this thing. It was like one small moment that was like expanded in so many facets to it. Uh, so thank you for that. We have a couple of uh, questions and comments in the chat. So Mariam's saying, is it possible that the women are familiar with this particular agent and that's why they come to collect their best money every month from him? So the women that the women that we spoke to, they had their designated agents. And the reason that they found out that it has is a beauty salon right there because the owner of that salon, she came to the agent and she said that this is the only person I trust who can transfer my money. So to uh, the idea of agent banking is also the trust factor and the influence factor that they have because it's a tight-knit community. So they know, okay, this is the person that we can trust. And we also asked her, so there's two agents that uh, that are side by side. We asked her, why did you go to the other agent? She said, oh, a couple of months ago, I gave him some money to transfer and the money was never transferred. So she lost her trust in the person and uh, she never went back to them. So yeah, uh, definitely trust in the agent but it's also this place that the agent is in. Now there's like, if you go into a remote area and this categorization also helps, like what kind of um, agent would you want to give this particular project, like the ISP dispersals, who would you want to give it to? So with this matrix, you can actually identify who is the agent who's trusted more. And then maybe you can assign them that these are the ones who will do the dispersals for us. So that yeah. is the whole idea. Yeah. I think there's yeah. other questions as well. Sinhal asked. Yeah. There's yeah. one by Arish, um, sorry, Arisha. She said uh, there could be a possibility that these women are forced to collect their amount like this. 
should then they have a closed and appropriate space for it i wouldn't use the word forced here i don't think they were forced to collect their amounts here because they can also go to different shops the mm-hmm. fact that they were here standing on the street just collecting their money it didn't look forced however this is something that can uh, be researched upon further to see if they're like are they are they forced to come here or like what are the factors there are definitely something that can be researched upon yeah good yeah, point yeah. arisha thank you and like you mentioned i think the dynamics of this streets like i know mariam navid in the audience which is an urban planner so maybe she can correct me but the way yeah. this is you know it's like bahut gamma gamma hai there are all different sorts of people so that just itself makes it maybe like a comfortable space and like you know a more as opposed to like a street mm. where this is this just men and they're like very close narrow yeah. alleys in that way yeah mariam can definitely uh, talk more about it but there's something um, that i read about urban planning as well thoda sa and that was uh, that urban planning in itself it can be very patriarchal so if you see a hardware store uske sath there would be a barber shop and end of the street it, this mm-hmm. was like a, an article in india end of the street is maybe a bar so there's a lot of men there in that and that just street itself the way it's designed it just becomes a patriarchal street so women aren't mm-hmm. as comfortable which is why i said the context that there's a sabzi wala and a lot of women they purchase vegetables and fruits there's also a doodh wala again Uh, and there's there's a, a beauty salon and there's a local restaurant so there's too much happening in the street and the street is just attracting people from all kinds of backgrounds uh, all genders like there's so much happening here so yeah, yeah maryam yeah. can yeah maryam has eyes on the street so maryam do you want to say something on that yeah. um okay we are running short on time so like one last question from sahel yeah. uh, what did you include in your video when you presenting this to the stakeholders So I went to different areas in Karachi and Islamabad, both uh, areas like Clifton, but then also areas like Shiri Jana Colony. So what we did it was a point of view where a user walks in from the end of the street to the shop, and there's narration in the background while we're capturing the surroundings as well. We're capturing what the building looks like. So we're taking, uh, trying to take like a two seventy degree. I wouldn't say three sixty. but uh, we take try to take 260 uh, 270 degree view of the space and then we're narrating it and then we're saying that these are the factors that influence how a user um, how how what a user experience looks like when they come to these shops and while we were here we also saw some uh, users making those transactions so there are also like snippets of their small interviews uh, incorporated in that video yeah okay perfect thank you so much for this adonia Uh, Thank you so much. Super, super fun to hear. Um, moving on to Manahil now. Um, so Manahil is a service designer and design researcher. She's currently based in Italy, where she's pursuing her MSc in product services design, service system design. Uh, her research interests lie in design for democracy and design for policy. She also loves reading fiction and watching sci-fi shows. Um, and uh, I am really glad Manahil could join us in this one because um, I think around Thanks. a year ago. I was sort of experimenting with like this sort of idea of having storytelling and design. She was one of the first people I talked to about this. So I'm really glad you're here with us, Manahil, for this. Thank you. Um, so quickly, just the same question from you. Firstly, what are the three things we find in your bag when you're out for research? Anti allergies, because uh, I have uh, a lot of breathing issues. So wherever I go to a place, I start sneezing because of pollen, because of dust. <laughs> Uh, mm. water for sure and um uh, adupatta is adonia said i think that's important yeah. okay and what is one thing in your room right now that you'd like to redesign i think the shutters on my window because i have curtains but i also have shutters mm. but those shutters like really get stuck and like, yeah it's a, it's a design problem <laughs> okay theek hai and lastly and i'm asking you this because you've lived enough time in like samad and karachi so Are you more of a mountains person or more of a beach person? Mountain person, but I love Karachi more. <laughs> okay, all right, that's a very diplomatic answer, but I'll take no, it. No, it's yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on to your story. You have the floor. Okay, thank you. And um, this story is about memes because memes tell stories, and how I got to know. more about memes is when i started my masters here i had a lecture on digital ethnography 
and that is something that i had never thought of before in so much detail like i knew that you know you can if you're working on a product you could go to um google play and read the reviews on it but i hadn't paid it much attention but then when my professor was talking in detail about digital ethnography and she was talking about memes and tweets and all sorts of posts that really inspired me and then she gave us uh, an assignment where we were working on the topic of energy poverty and me and my group members so the other group members were not from pakistan they were from different countries we decided to work on uh, pakistan just because energy poverty or load shedding or being without electricity is an important issue and we had to interview people so we decided on um, interviewing female students in karachi and their experience with load shedding and because it was a short assignment we couldn't do like a lot of interviews so we interviewed some students from karachi in detail and we heard their stories which were like how they do different jugars or different uh, you know they, they do different ways of studying with that situation but then at the same time uh, we i ended up realizing that memes could be really interesting um you know to see what's happening on a larger scale because i don't have time to do so many interviews so what we ended up doing was that um i researched a lot for memes for posts for tweets and that includes different facebook groups like voice of customer voice of dha all the random you know big public groups that i was in halat updates and what not then on twitter you have the search option so you can search for things and then directly on google and then our research participants we also asked them to send us their favorite memes and then so we had these hundreds of screenshots and then we did an analysis of them and we could see some really interesting patterns that were complementing some things that were coming from the interviews for example a lot of people hold the government accountable through the memes or through their posts but something also interesting is the relatability of the situation so when we asked our um, research participants that you know do you look at memes or you know do you send memes they were like yes because it's such something so relatable because sometimes when it happens you feel like oh i'm the only person who doesn't have a generator who is you know just going crazy because you have a really important assignment due tomorrow and everything is not working but then the moment you see these memes you realize that okay half of the country is dealing with it and then they share it with their um, other friends their colleagues so for them this hilarity of the situation this relatability of the situation was something very interesting that emerged from memes then um, another thing was another story that these memes told was of collective memory so you see this dictator guy on our bottom right i don't want to name him i don't know if it puts us in to trouble naming him but yeah this dictator guy we were most of us were not even born when this guy came into par and all especially the people who are students right now like i'm still you know a few years older than them so if they're university students they're 18 they were definitely not born during this time but you know this memory that you this collective memory of a nation of your parents and of uh, things that you study in your history lessons that okay there was a blackout and then after the blackout there was this new thing on the screen and then everyone announced that okay there's been uh, assemblies have been dissolved or whatever so it's it's political commentary it's this collective memory then i saw another post that's not here which was showing a picture of a newspaper from the 80s where the load shedding problems were discussed and it said that you know now we are in uh, 2023 or whatever but we still have those problems and then it was also interesting to see that we had two major black power blackouts in the whole country one in january 2021 and one in january 2023 so a lot of people made memes when there's a country wide blackout and for me that was telling a story about those young people right that imagine there's a country wide blackout and you have no idea ki light wapas kab aayegi aur aapke phones mein har waqt nahi har cheez charged hoti but jo aapka precious charge hai aapke phone ka aapke laptop ka jo precious mobile data hai you're using that to make a meme what does it say about you like does it like does it help you cope with the situation does it say that okay i need to make something and then maybe i will realize that, okay other people are fighting it uh, relatable so it's a very interesting coping mechanism and then the interviews i was doing i asked them about this and they were like hey yeah, yeah it is a coping mechanism but it's a very fleeting mo- coping mechanism like if you make a meme or if you see a meme at the end of the day you have to deal with the reality of the situation so they said that they enjoy memes but then 
you know, they have, at one point they have to return to the reality of the situation. So for me, all these memes that I looked at and um, when were they posted, who made them. So yeah, it was very interesting for me to compliment them and also the posts and uh, tweets and Facebook posts and whatever with the research and see how different patterns like sort of merge together. Like a lot of people were asking about um, suggestions on uh, voice of customer. The, what is the solar panel company, which is the best? If I have to, if I have this budget, what, which UPS can I buy? Which generator can I buy? So I think that's something really important that maybe as design researchers, we are overlooking. But at the same time, I know there is something so exclusive because a majority of our population doesn't have access to social media or smartphones. So it is still exclusive, but if you're working on a topic like, for example, food delivery apps, banking apps, uh, what else? Yeah, ride hailing apps. A lot of times you would see memes on them, like Food Panda Riders, there are many memes on them. What is happening with them? Food Panda, the help service of their health service, they make screenshots of memes that they make. You know, I said this to them and this is what they replied. Yeah, on the opposite side, that they were very cordial but the person said something random to them so you can see a lot of these things and for many products even you know easy pasa and all of them you can see a lot of rants a lot of complaints even on linkedin like it was interesting for me to see that sometimes people tag banking officials on linkedin that you know i've been trying to call for help but nobody has been picking up so does anyone know here who is in xyz bank and always 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 their problems get solved because linkedin is such a fancy public platform that no banker wants their bank, you know, like sort of, uh, so yeah, I think that's my story that as researchers, we have this brilliant um, plethora of stories just lying there and we can complement them with our field research and find interesting insights. Thank you. I, this is so interesting. I would have never thought of memes as a design research tool. Uh, yeah, but this, exactly. this puts that into like the way you can sort of use it so um, I'm curious about how do you sort of like document this or make this a part of your you know the official documentation whatever you're working on is it that some of the insights are complemented with this memes is it like a section on its own or like how do you go about that process of uh, conveying this that this is the research you got out of these memes I think that's a good question and it depends on you know, who the audience for your research is. For us, it was just our professor. So in our research, we had two sections. One was just about the memes, like the initial section where the insights from the interviews were separate and the insights from the memes were separate. But then there was an overall section where the emerging insights were discussed and where both of these things were discussed together. And for me, another challenge was translating these memes because these memes are so cultural. And my group members, they were not from Pakistan. And my professor as well. So I was like, okay, how do I even, you know, translate these memes? How do I even give context to these memes? So I had two lines under almost all the memes. So the memes which were not in English, I had one line of translation. And then I had another, you know, caption below it, which was the context. For example, this guy, we know who this guy is, the dictator. Or this uh, guy with the, you know, this pose. This pose is still more common, but the dictator only we know. Or Bollywood movies as well. So when I was presenting this in my class, um, all my Indian classmates were laughing because they could understand that these were coming from Bollywood movies. But for other people, I had to give a lot of context. It was hard. Okay, interesting. Um, and what have been some of the, have you used this technique in like other projects also that you might have had the chance to work on? And like, how was that yeah. received from the people, from the audience? Like you mentioned, Kivo, in an audience, see, they uh, found it really like interesting and funny. But like, was the professor into it? Did he understand, okay, okay, this is an interesting way to look at things? Yeah, she definitely was because she herself has done a lot of digital ethnography projects, different projects. So she was, you know, she really appreciated it. Another project is one that I'm working on right now. And yeah, so for that also, I'm looking at memes. So once it's published, I can tell you more about how the reaction is like. But yeah, I, I definitely want more options of doing this because once now I've started doing it, it's so much fun now. Every time I have a topic where I can do it, like collecting memes from my interviewees or looking at searching at Twitter and 
th this time it was hard because the memes I was looking at were also video memes. So then I had to start the like either find a way to download those videos or start the screen recording off my computer. And when I write a report about it, I maybe I should put a link or something to access those videos because you know sometimes. But also another thing that I found interesting now, I cannot share the topic for some privacy reasons of what I'm working on right now, but also the generational memes. So the memes that your parents send you are different. And then the parents that my friends send me are different. And then the generation who's younger than me, Gen Z, their memes are different. So you can also see the, like different generation has different um, humor styles and different, like mm -hmm. the younger generation memes are more likely to be videos or GIFs than the older generation. So that was also interesting. Uh, yeah, and that also just gives you quite interesting insight into the personas. Like, okay, there's like a generation persona and there's a more a younger persona. Yeah. How yeah. We, uh, we have one question in the chat. How do you deal with the story when there are biases in the memes? Like sometimes people make them just to make fun of others. Um, how do you seek the truth in that? I think that's a valid point, Arisha, and I've not encountered it personally till now. But yeah, in some political memes, you see it that, you know, if one some certain people are supporting one political party, so they'll always make memes about, you know, making fun of the other political party. But I think that one thing that we have here that we don't have in other um, field research is the is the numbers. Because Dusri field research mein kya hota? we have limited time, so we can, you know, do limited surveys or interviews or observations. But here, for me, that would be an outlier meme if it's one. But if if there are like hundreds or thousands of memes talking about the same thing, like you know, like these days, the Kate Middleton memes, for example, that's not a Pakistani related thing, but yeah. So, you know, sometimes you can't ignore them because yeah, they have a bias, but th that says something about how people are processing certain information that they're being fed through the news or that they're not being fed through the news. So yeah. I think it's your call as a designer at the end of the day. And uh, But yeah, numbers do help, like seeing a lot, a lot, a lot of info and seeing, okay, what are the larger patterns and what are outliers? Yeah, yeah. Um, and just for future reference, I think I'm all for Kate Middleton means. I think use them whenever <laughs> there is no bias involved in that. <laughs> um thank you so much for this uh thank you. um so i think we've taken questions throughout and we're also just like at the end of our time but like um naya bedonia i mean if you have questions for each other or anything you want to say before we wrap it up um that'd be great if not that's also fine I think just the stories Nayab and Adonia shared were really inspiring and it was like really interesting to see this and i miss i miss it now that i'm in italy i miss doing the field research in pakistan it's, it's something different i really wanna <laughs> do that again so it was it was really nice to hear their stories great um nice. all right so thank you so much all three of you for taking out the time uh and joining us for this this was really lovely i hope the audience also really enjoyed it um, so if any of you have more questions or want to follow up on any of these techniques or insight they've shared, you can reach out to them on their LinkedIn. Uh, we've tagged them in our post. Um, and yeah, we hope to see you again soon in one of our webinars that we put up next. But thank you for your time. Have a lovely evening. Uh, Rafiz. Rafiz, thank you so much. Rafiz, bye.